soul okay um let us pray and let's uh, begin uh, this morning i uh, would like to request uh, any one of us to please lead us in a word of prayer yes uh, sitkinu please please go ahead thank you father we come to the throne of grace lord thank you for this session lord you have given us lord we will be clearing all our doubts in jesus name lord this are what we are going to spend lord this day what you have given us thank you for this day lord many people not here to see this day but we are grateful to you lord that you have made a, a, available and made us able lord you have seen lord in our in us lord whatever we are learning in this bible college lord let it be used for your kingdom lord for the kingdom expansion for the spreading of the gospel lord thank you for this day thank you for this opportunity in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you sitkenu thank you for leading us in prayer um so as we uh, usually do in our mentoring hour we will uh, take up questions you know, any anything that uh, you have been thinking about wondering about and uh, we have uh, our faculty uh, here on the call so you know uh, they will help answer those questions so would just like to encourage us to go ahead and uh, uh, ask those questions you can put it on the chat or you can even unmute yourselves and ask them so please feel free to do that these can be questions regarding something that uh, uh you are um uh studying or learning uh personally by yourself or they can be questions from some of the courses um that uh, you know uh, you uh, are attending so it can be questions from anywhere uh, just things that we are thinking about Yes, thank you, Avni. Avni has a question here. Um, she asks, "People claim to visit heaven and see their loved ones there. How true um, uh, these uh, these claims are?" So that's Avni's question. Um, uh, just like to request our faculty, anyone, uh, please feel free. You can go ahead and answer this question. Okay, uh, I'd like to request uh, Pastor Jay Kumar. Pastor, uh, would you like to answer this? Um, yeah, Nancy. Uh, I'm just trying to see if there's a biblical, you know, president. Yeah, sure, sure, uh, sure. That's sure. what. Um, but then, um, um, visiting heaven. We know that it is possible in the sense, if, and the Lord, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know makes it possible uh, because uh, uh, paul had that kind of an experience so we know that it is possible to whom the lord um, you know takes them to the, through that um so so that aspect of it is uh, it is it is possible um and, and to see their loved ones there well uh, well we know that that is also possible but the but the real um, challenge is you know to to really discern and uh, and uh, I, i kind of certify you know is it something of my own you know because that that's what i desire you know that's that's on my heart that i want to see the loved ones heaven is it something of my own uh, ima ima uh, you know i want to say imagination but it's my you know, strong desire and will and therefore is it something that uh, that's happening as a result of that maybe a dream or something or or is it something that uh, you know real experience uh, so that would be um, you know that would be a very subjective thing 
So, I, so I think my response is: it is possible that the Lord would grant such an experience, and for you know, for whatever reason it is, maybe to encourage, maybe to um, you know, uh, you know, propel us further in in the call, pursuit of God and the call of God. Um, but uh, the question is really: to how do we verify it? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to see if there's a yeah a biblical precedent. Uh, yeah. I'll, can I just leave it there? <laughs> response. Thanks. Yes, yes, Pastor. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, uh, sharing that. Uh, I, I'd like to leave it open for any other uh, faculty. If you would like to add to what uh, Pastor Jaikumar just shared, you can do that, please. Okay, uh, Avni, I hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, what I what I'm actually the question this came to me was that um, do do the believers when they die do they directly go to heaven or is uh, you were we all waiting for a judgment time to come? So where are the people before that? Is it heaven? And when people see him, they go to heaven and they see their loved ones. So I'm just saying, uh, because it says uh, in Thessalonians that uh, those who die are sleeping in the Lord. And they will also, uh, you know, be alive when uh, Jesus comes uh, at the time of the rapture. So uh, keeping that in mind, I was wondering, uh, are the people already in heaven or they're sleeping in the Lord, waiting for Jesus to come and... Uh, you know, we will all go together. We who are alive uh, also will go with them to heaven. So, uh, th those thinking on those lines, I was a bit uh, confused. Okay, maybe I'll, um, I'll just uh, okay, uh, I'll just answer that part of the question. I mean, so there are several scriptures we can look at. Uh, Philippians chapter one. Um, I think uh, uh, you know the whole chapter, but then there is that section where Paul says. Um, for me to be, um, uh, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then he says, um, I'll give you the exact verse here. Um, uh, verse 23, to uh, uh, he, you know, he says, um, I'm hard pressed between the two. To depart and be with Christ is far better. Philippians 1, verse 23. So that means when he departs, that is when he dies, where is he going to go? He's going to go and be with Christ. Another scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, he says here in 2 Corinthians 5, and uh, uh, to be, pres uh, verse 8, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse eight. So when a believer dies, is absent from the body, he is immediately present with the Lord. Right? Uh, Hebrews twelve. Uh, I'm just giving you the scriptures here. So where do the spirits go? Right. So of righteous people. Uh, Hebrews twelve, and um, verse uh, twenty three. It says uh, that he is the God. He is the Judge of all. The spirits of just men made perfect. So where do the spirits of just men go? They go directly to be with God. So to answer the first part of your question, uh, when, when a believer dies, his spirit, and there is the soul part of the spirit, that means the part of the spirit that, uh, you know, that has the, the faculties of recognition, seeing, knowing, hearing, feeling, all that. So that, that's the soul part of the spirit. So that as, as a person, the inner person goes to be with the Lord. Now, First Thessalonians 4, uh, Paul uses the word sleep, uh, which is translated in the English Bible as sleep, uh, more as a, um, a, a description of the state of a believer. It doesn't mean that people actually go to sleep now. When a person dies, it's as though he's asleep, meaning when we sleep, the, the uh, implication is we're going to rise up again, we're going to wake up. So that's the idea there in First Thessalonians 4. It doesn't mean that there is a place where believers are asleep or that there's a state of us being asleep. No. It simply means when we die, we die. That means what happens when we die? James 2, 26. 
the body without the spirit is dead. So what happens when we die? The body is without the spirit. So it's not that the spirit is sleeping in the body in the ground. No. Uh, when the body dies, the, the spirit leaves the body. Where does it go? The scriptures we've just mentioned, the spirit goes to be with the Lord. What happens to the body? The body decays. So there is no state of sleep. You know, uh, I know that some uh, cults or some people talk about the state of sleep, this intermediary state. But uh, that's not uh, true because the Bible says the spirit leaves the body and goes to be with the Lord. So that is why when you look at First Thessalonians chapter 4, it says when Christ comes, he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So that means those who have died in Jesus, where have they gone? They've gone to be with Jesus. That's why he's bringing them with him, right? And the bodies will be raised. So that means their spirits come with Jesus, they reunite with their bodies and uh, go up. So that's the other part of your question. And then the third part of your question is, is there recognition in heaven? I mean, will we recognize each other in heaven? Of course. Uh, you know, for example, we see and many examples. We see, for instance, when Stephen was being stoned in Acts 5, he saw, looked into heaven. His eyes were open. And did he recognize whom he saw? Yes, he saw. He says, I see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. So he is recognizing whom he is seeing in heaven. Uh, John in the book of Revelation he he's able to recognize he's able to recognize the 24 elders the cherub the uh, the angelic beings the angels uh, he recognizes the elder who was speaking to him uh, uh, of course he confuses the elder with an angel because he's never not encountered these kinds of you know this so he falls down to worship the elder and the elder says don't worship me i'm just like one of you um so uh, that's that's one thing. And then again, in the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Peter, James, and John, when they see Moses and Elijah, they recognize them. Now, Peter, James, and John had never seen even a photograph of Moses. They had never seen him on Instagram. <laughs> None of that. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, when they saw what happened? They knew that was Moses, that was Elijah. How do they know? They've never seen these people before. They never know photographs, nothing. Uh, uh, for, um, you know, uh, the, uh, First John 3 says, when we see him, we will be like him. Uh, and uh, First Corinthians 13 says, we will know even as we are known. That means the level of knowledge that we have in this spiritual state is going to it's going to be tremendous right so first corinthians 13 13 i think it is uh, we will know uh, even as we are known that means we will know everything uh, and uh, we will uh, be able to uh, yeah this is yeah verse 12 first corinthians 13 12 we will know even as we are known so there's going to be this you know even though we have never met paul or david or so on just like how on the Mount of Transfiguration, they just recognize that's Moses, that's Elijah. Uh, our spiritual sense, a spirit being recognizes uh, other spiritual beings. So I think, does it answer all your questions? Yes, Pastor, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you for uh, answering Avni's question. Uh, good question there, Avni. Um, Elisha uh, asks a question uh, quite related to you know what we are talking about. So Elisha's question is, what does the resurrection of the dead mean to Christianity? Will unbelievers also experience resurrection? What would the resurrection of believers be from unbelievers? So there are three questions uh, that Elisha has asked. Uh, yes, again, uh, any of our faculty, if you would like to take this up, can please go ahead. Yeah, Elisha, just to put it very quickly, yes. uh, uh, we see three resurrections in the scriptures, right? Just to just give you a quick summary, You'll, we'll study this in detail when we talk about the end times. The first is uh, the resurrection of the believers, all the saints. Um, uh, so when you talk about resurrection, we're talking about coming into our, uh, coming back to life, into 
our you know uh, a state we're going to live for continuously thereafter um, so there's the resurrection of believers at the secret coming of Christ the coming of Christ for the church right we read about this in first Thessalonians chapter 4 and also first Corinthians chapter 15 we call it the secret coming of Christ or the coming of Christ for the church or the rapture of the church you know, just the same thing so there's going to be the resurrection of believers only believers those who have died in Christ will happen then uh, what we see is we have the tribulation happening and uh, we don't know for sure whether this is going to, you know, how this is going to happen. But in Revelation, the 14th chapter, we see the 144,000 Jews who were who are martyrs who died during the uh, tribulation. They are caught up into heaven. This is in Revelation 14, right? These were the 144,000 Jews, and this happens somewhere around the uh, the middle of the tribulation. Uh, it doesn't tell us clearly there that. Uh, you know, uh, that they were resurrected. But the language used, this is in Revelation 14, verse 4, uh, is is the language that is used, talking about the first fruits. Um, so the language that is used there, is, it seems to indicate a resurrection. So that is another resurrection we see, right? But I'm not, it's not 100% clear, but I'm, I'm just putting it down as a resurrection. The third resurrection, is at the end of the seven year tribulation. You read about this in uh, Revelation chapter 20 and verse four. Um, it is um, the souls, it is, it is all those who died as believers during the tribulation, they will be raised up. Okay, so this is at the end of the seven year tribulation, Revelation 20 verse four. All those who died in believers, who died uh, believing in Jesus, who were killed during the tribulation, will be raised up. Okay, the third resurrection. All these three have to do with believers, only believers, those who have died in Christ. Right? And then there is a final resurrection, which is the at the end of the millennium, which is Revelation 20 and verse 13, or verses 12 and 13. That is every human person who ever lived will be raised up. That is the resurrection of the unbelievers revelation 12 chapter 20 verses 12 and 13 every human person will be raised up and there'll be the great white throne judgment but that great white throne judgment uh, is not the judgment of the believers that is the judgment of only the unbelievers they will already be divided the sheep and the goats will be already divided jesus described that in matthew 25 he said you know there will be the sheep and the goats so that means they're already separated and the great white throne judgment is only for the unbelievers. Believers are already judged prior to that. The believer's judgment is for rewards, not for salvation. The great white throne judgment, end of end of the seven year tribulation, Revelation twenty, is uh, is uh, you know for the unbelievers, and they will be forever cast into the lake of fire. So what we've mentioned is. Three revelation for three resurrections where only believers are involved. One, the last one is unbelievers are involved. Is that okay? Thank you very much, Pastor. Yes. How come? So thank you, Pastor. Um, thank you, Elisha, for that question. Uh, we have a few more questions here in our in our chat. Uh, so Sitkanu asks this question. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'll just read it out for us. Uh, I have a question. Uh, it may sound silly, but uh, as we read in books or see in TV, is it possible like a man who have died to be reincarnated? Okay, so means a person died and was born after some time again, like the body was new, but the spirit is the same. So uh, Sitkinu's question is about reincarnation. And he asks if um, uh, any given person you know, can die and be uh, born again in this world. So um, yes, uh, if any of the faculty would like to take this up, uh, you can do so. Yes, I just wanted to, 
sorry. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to share one one verse that is Hebrews nine and verse twenty seven, um, which says very clearly, and as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this the judgment. Um, so um, you know, uh, so there's no question of reincarnation. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yes, Pastor. That was the same verse I wanted to share. No problem. Nine Hebrews nine twenty seven. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kumar and Pastor Paul. Uh, so, Sitkinu, uh, is that all right? I think they've answered the question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sitkinu. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next question here. And John Paul. Uh, Okay. Uh, John asks uh, from Revelation 22 and verse 2, uh, I'll read the, the verse for us. It says, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Uh, so based on this verse, he asks, does this talk about the new Jerusalem? What does this mean to be healing of the nations? Would there be other nations in the new Jerusalem? Okay, um, uh, Pastor, would you please like to answer this question, John's question? Um, yeah, so John, um, the answer is yes, it is talking about the new Jerusalem, right? So in Revelation 21, uh, after there are new heavens and the new earth, so after the great white throne judgment, uh, people are cast into the lake of fire, then there is uh, the new heavens and the new earth, Second Peter chapter 3, everything is renovated by fire, cleaned out, then the heavenly Jerusalem descends from heaven, the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem descends onto the earth. So uh, physically or literally, heaven comes to earth. And so then Revelation 21 and 22 describe the city, right? That uh, And what how the city will look like. And as part of the city, Revelation 22 describes this river of life flowing through um, the tree of life uh, being there for the healing of the nations. So uh, several questions of why do the nations need to be healed? So uh, the, the tree of life, the leaves, are for the healing. So when we think about healing, we doesn't we don't have to think about that they're going to be sick to be healed, but rather this is the tree, the the leaves are for the health, the well-being of the nations. The word nations is uh, uh, literally means uh, it doesn't mean nations as we understand it, like uh, America, China, Japan, whatever. But the word nation simply means people groups. To, kinds of peoples so basically it's describing or you know uh, the, the the normal greek word is ethne so these are people groups so it's talking about all kinds like what you know uh, john had this you know in, in revelation 5 and also in revelation 7 he says yeah, i saw peoples from every tribe tongue and nation right so every people group that so it's saying that they will uh, these nations means peoples of all tribes languages as we understand it as earth People, we understand. They'll all be there, saved, saved people. Will be in part in this new Jerusalem, and the leaves are for their ongoing health, the perpetuity of health. Uh, that's the idea there. It's okay, John. Uh, so, Pastor, does that mean uh, all the believers, nations, as a group of people? Yeah, all believers, all believers, uh, those who have been saved uh, from all nations in all people groups uh, yeah just so to ask there. one follow-up question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so would uh, the believers who are saved before the coming of jesus would us be the part of new jerusalem as a city or uh, the other nations as we mentioned um sorry say that again john what was the question uh, Say that again, uh, please. Pastor, would the believers who are saved before the coming of Jesus, like yeah. the, before the rapture, would it be, uh, those people be part of the new Jerusalem as a city or as a part of the nations that we mentioned? Huh? Yeah. So uh, who would be in the new Jerusalem? All saints, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, uh, those saved before the rapture, those saved after the rapture everyone so right from adam all the way to 
see the last person who's born i don't know <laughs> during the during the uh, tribulation i mean during the millennium uh, so from adam till the last person who's born everyone who's saved right who has been saved by faith through the grace of god old testament saints new testament saints those saved during the tribulation those saved during the millennium everyone will be part of the new jerusalem yeah pastor um I, I, sorry one more uh, thing here so what had so who is this nations because everyone else is wiped out and i mean let's say all the non believers or uh, who are not believing in christ are moved to eternal judgment so from where comes this set of uh, nations pastor uh, we are there right uh it's talking about us so nations simply means people groups all right all right yeah okay yeah it's not nations as we understand it right it's nations is so we could have read that verse as saying uh, i saw you know uh, uh uh what was that verse again what did you put sorry oh your question at uh, the healing of the nations oh okay 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 22 yeah so uh, the healing of the nations the leaves the tree were for the healing of people groups right uh, it could have been rendered that way yeah but the yeah, nations sure. is, that word is confusing but just means different kinds of race, races of people yeah yeah okay boss star thank you pastor and thank you john for that question um uh, so far you know uh, questions have come in so thank you for that a few more here in the chat uh, elisha asks this question what does this phrase mean pass over to the lord from numbers 9 and verse 14 let's uh, quickly read that verse first so numbers 9 verse 14 and if a stranger dwells among you and would uh, keep the lord's passover he must do it so according to the right of the passover and according to its ceremony you shall have one ordinance both for the stranger and the native of the land so his question is specific to that phrase their lord's passover a passover to the lord um what does this phrase mean so it's open for any of uh, the faculty to take up an answer um yeah so elisha uh, elisha sorry um uh, it's it just it is just referring to the feast of the passover which uh uh like all the other feasts uh, the jewish people were instructed to keep right so they have uh, seven major feasts uh that every year they 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 keep and then there are, there are others as well but seven other there are seven main ones and passover is one of the seven main feasts now passover is referred to as you know the lord's passover or uh, for several reasons one is because it is an it was an ordinance given by the lord the lord said keep this this feast as you know to, as a remembrance of what happened uh when the lord delivered his people uh, out of egypt uh it is also uh, indicating that you know it was the lord who passed over his people the lord uh, protected his people he became a covering for his people uh, and so the lord uh, protected in that sense of being a covering for his people uh so that's why it's referred to as you know the passover of the lord or the lord's passover um but it's basically just referring to the passover feast so uh we shouldn't get confused by the language whether it says the passover of the lord or the lord's passover it just referring to the feast of the passover is that okay okay pastor thank you very much thank you very much thank you
first i just have a, a question on this first uh, is it okay if i can ask a question yes please uh, uh, yes first uh, i was re reading a couple of commentaries and in numbers 914 uh, it says that and if a stranger it starts off with a stranger dwells among you uh, and so the writer i forget which commentary is this uh, but the writer says it could be also for gentiles who uh, you know uh, want to follow the 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 feast so they they need to get circumcised so the so so the writer says that the passover to the lord um, you know is like like get circumcised and then you know you can come in and participate in the feast uh, uh, of the jews so uh, i i'm not sure if uh, that is right yeah um probably i mean we have to read the rest of this um and, uh, yeah so probably that's pro you know if you read numbers nine the rest of it it might might be there uh that that's how the stranger should participate and and they had did have the practice right if of gentiles proselytes basically gentiles becoming jews they would then go through the same rites of a, uh, of of, uh, of of becoming a Jew, so um, I mean, to what you're saying, yeah, that that's true. Um, but I guess uh, the question was, well, what does the Passover to the Lord mean? So I'm just responding to that. But what you're saying is true, Paul. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you for answering Elisha and uh, uh, Paul's question. Uh, we have another question here from Divya. Uh, and somehow the questions seem to, uh, in most of the questions today seem to be about the resurrection and, you know, the rapture and things like that. So Divya's question is along the same lines. She asks, after the rapture and during tribulation, will there be people other than the Jews who would put their trust in Jesus Christ, is the tribulation a time for the Jews to come to repentance specifically? Okay, so uh, yes, there are two questions here. Uh, yeah, I think Pastor, uh, can I please ask you again to uh, answer Divya's question? Okay, okay, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. So, Let's see now. Let's break the question down. After that, so during the will there be people other than the Jews who would put their trust in Jesus Christ? So the first part of the question, the answer is yes. Right? Uh, there, there will be people all over the world who put their trust in Jesus Christ. How, how do we know that? Uh, we see uh, in the book of, you know, as we progress from chapter four. So chapter four onwards is, describing for us what happens during the tribulation and what do we see right we see uh, for uh, for example in uh, Re revelation 5 so so as we're progressing through revelation uh, we get glimpses of earth and we get glimpses of heaven right so uh, when we every time we get a glimpse of heaven during the tribulation we see that there are people there who are redeemed from every tribe tongue and nation so uh, revelation 5 uh, verse 9, you have redeemed us from every tribe, people, and nation. Again, in Revelation 7, uh, it talks about people who are uh, worshipping the Lord. Uh, and they have come. Let's see here. Where is this? Uh, we read Revelation 5. We also, um, Revelation 7, 9. Again, it's always seeing this great multitude, people, tongues, tribes, and nations. Uh, they're standing before the throne. And who are they? Uh, Revelation 7, 14, they are the ones who've come out of the tribulation. That means these are the spirits of people who've died in the tribulation. They're before the throne. And where are the, you know, and, and it says they're from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we know that uh, people are uh, from all the nations are being saved. Other things that we can also say is um, in uh, Revelation 9, um, uh, uh, there are people Revelation 9 20, there are people from the whole world, rest of mankind, who do not repent. That means uh, on one side, there are a lot of people turning to the Lord, but the other side, there are also people uh, being in rebellion. In a couple of other scriptures we see is um, Revelation 13, the gospel is being preached to 
all those who dwell on the earth. Right? Um, uh, so, yeah, so Revelation, sorry, Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. Uh, we see the the gospel being preached and the warnings being given to everyone on the earth. So you know, there are several references through Revelation uh, that uh, show us that uh, there will be people other than Jews who put their trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, the second part of your question, is the tribulation a time for the Jews to come to repentance specifically? Well, um, we have to understand the tribulation in two ways. One is this. Uh, the Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, right? And uh, the, the focus, uh, let, let's, let me put it like this, the focal point is, is Israel during the seven year tribulation. That's the focal point, but all nations of the earth will be affected, right? So everybody will suffer. So when you look at the, the series of uh, judgments that are taking place, it talks about, you know, a third of vegetation being destroyed. Uh, so many things happening throughout the earth, global. So uh, the impact or the effect of the tribulation is global, but the focal point is people of Israel, right? Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 27, uh, Gabriel speaks to Daniel and says, I want to tell you what is going to happen to you and to your people specifically, right? So again, that it shows us that the focal point of the tribulation period is uh, the Jewish people or Israel, but uh, the effects of all the judgments will be global, right? So is God doing it? mainly to bring Jews back to himself? Uh, the answer is yes. How do we know that? Um, Revelation chapter 11, verse 25, uh, Paul, uh, not Revelation, I'm saying, sorry, Romans, I'm thinking of Romans, I'm saying Revelation. Uh, Romans 11 uh, uh, and verse 25, um, let me get Romans 11, 25, yeah. Uh, Romans 11, 25, Paul uh, tells us that, you know, at this, mind, at this time, when God is dealing with the church, he has temporarily turned his attention to the church, right? Uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That means he's waiting right now, Romans 11, 25, for the Gentiles to come in. So then the last phase is, let me turn my attention to the Jewish people, but uh, there is, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a very severe way in which he's dealing with the Jewish people during that time, right? And it'll all culminate in Zechariah 12. Uh, there will be the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Jewish people. Uh, I'll give you the exact verse, Zechariah 12, I think it's verse 14. Uh, uh, Zechariah 12, um, sorry, verse 10. So it'll all culminate with this. There'll be this great outpouring on the Jewish people uh, that will cause a lot of them to turn to the Lord, right? And that they will then see, uh, in, they will recognize that they have, uh, you know, they have, they, they actually, they, their eyes will see the one whom they have pierced. Zechariah twelve ten says that they will see Jesus come back. Uh, so, on. so to answer your question, yeah, that is part of what will happen during the tribulation. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, uh, one more, uh, like it's, uh, it is understandable, but uh, like uh, so during tribulation, whoever uh, comes to faith apart from the Jewish people, you know, the uh, the manner in which they come to faith will be really hard, right? It will be really difficult. Yes, yes. True? And many of them will die for their faith. That's why we yeah. see them already in heaven coming up into, from the tribulation. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Nancy, also for the reference. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Divya, and thank you, Pastor, for uh, answering that question. Uh, Taisha has uh, a question. Uh, she asks, when people die, where do they go? Heaven or paradise? Can you give scriptural reference? Okay. So do people go? to heaven or paradise. Okay, uh, we had answered, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
a similar question, Taisha. Uh, today, sometime earlier, and there were two references given. I'll just back up and share those references with you. Uh, one is um, Philippians one twenty three. The other one, uh, Second Corinthians five eight. Uh, and uh, in Philippians one twenty three, um, where Paul says. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, uh, which is far better. So he talks about being with Christ, okay, or being in the presence of God. Uh, and Second uh, Corinthians five eight, where uh, you know it says to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So we know that you know a believer is present with the Lord, so uh, in God's presence. But you're asking more specifically, is it heaven or paradise? Um, okay. Uh, so I'll just share uh, what I know, uh, but I think with script scriptural reference, I'm not too sure if I can give you that. Maybe some uh, some of our faculty can help me with that. Uh, but yes, we see earlier, uh, like when we read about, um, you know, even Jesus, when he talks about uh, Lazarus, okay, Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. So uh, we see that uh, before the Lord Jesus died and he, um, you know, he, he went and took the authority like we, we read about him going and um, you know uh, setting people free um, right in uh, in the low parts of the earth. So we read about that. Uh, till Jesus did that, we know that there is a reference to paradise, and paradise uh, was also known as Abraham's bosom. Um, but after after the the um, like after the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, we don't see that reference so uh yeah paradise is heaven is what i would say and uh, i would just request uh, any of our faculty to please add or correct me if i'm wrong thank you okay um uh, pastor shared some references here in the chat second corinthians 12 4 revelation 2 7 um uh, which also say that paradise is now heaven okay uh, is that okay taisha do you have any follow-up question to ask? No, thank you. That's okay. No follow-up question. I wanted to just confirm because that's what my that was my initial thinking, but I just said let me ask experts okay. just um to because someone posed that question to me and I answered and I think now since the resurrection of Christ, paradise should be now heaven. But I said let me ask to make sure I answer correctly. Okay, sure. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes, thank you, Taisha. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, if uh, you have any more questions, anything else that you're thinking about, please do share, ask the question. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, Divya, you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, this might be a, uh, uh, like, uh, it might have been covered in some of our courses, but I just wanted a clarification. Like when it says that Jesus Christ is our advocate and he is interceding or he's uh, uh, mediating. Uh, so my question is, what is uh, Jesus interceding for us. What exactly is uh, Jesus interceding? Okay, thank you, Divya. So Divya asks, uh, Jesus is our intercessor, but what is he interceding about for us? Uh, yes, yeah, some things we can see in scripture, uh, they are, and I think maybe the main thing is for us to uh, overcome, to be overcomers, right? So, um, and overcome various things. So, Hebrews 2 and verse 17, I think it cap 17 and 18, it captures this beautifully because it talks about Jesus being the high priest. 
and it says he aids those who are tempted Hebrews 2 17 and 18 so as of a high priest right uh, he's interceding uh, and uh, what is he interceding for one is when we are being tempted tested so tempted with that word tempted um, could uh, or say it it, 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 it it refers to any kind of hardship so whether it's a temptation which is an inducement to sin or whether it's a trial or a tribulation which is you know life's difficulty challenges in in all of that he is interceding so that we could be aided we could be assisted we could be helped right now um, unlike human intercessors who can intercede for one person at a time he is the omniscient intercessor meaning he can intercede for the entire church at the same time. Uh, so that's one, that's an, the intercession which only God can do, right? Meaning he's interceding for me, he's interceding for all of us, now all the believers all over the world. So uh, so that's, that's the big difference between Jesus being our high priest and other people praying for us, right? Um, so, but, but he's praying for us to aid us when we are being tempted, when we're going through life's challenges. The other thing we see in Hebrews 3, 1 is that as a high priest, he's the high priest of our confession. So that's the second thing we can see that uh, he's standing before heaven. Uh, and Jesus put this in, in Matthew 10, 32. He said, and if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. That means uh, when we acknowledge him, when we acknowledge what he has done, uh, when we testify to it, when we speak to it, then he's saying, I'm standing before that. I'm standing on or representing that before the Father. So he's the high priest of our confession. So that's the other thing he's interceding for or representing us for. That is our confession, that the faith that we are professing and standing in and believing, he is representing that before the Father and saying, Father, this, uh, you know, that person standing on the word, we are going to send aid, we're going to make that word come true in their lives and so on. So these are things we can see. And of course, um, uh, Hebrews 7.25 says, you know, he's, he, he saves us to the uttermost. So uh, uh, just dealing with uh, whatever a believer is going through, save to the uttermost. That word save again means to heal, to deliver, to protect, to the uttermost, to the Father's extent. Uh, Jesus is doing that for us. So we could see this. And if you want to, you could also look at the Old Testament type, you know, uh, the high priest there, how he went before the Father, um, before God, carrying the 12 tribes, representing them. Jesus, in a much greater way, representing all believers uh, before the Father. Yeah, I, I just uh, had a question also regarding this. So when it says in Revelation 12, 10 that uh, satan is accuser of our brethren who accused them before our god day and night has been cast down uh, so is it is it like um, satan is continuously accusing the believers and uh, is there a role that jesus christ pray, uh, plays in that now at the present time yeah so we need to understand that very clearly because a misunderstanding of that Hebrews, uh, Revelation 12, 10 has given to this whole teaching on the courts of heaven, which, <laughs> you know, which, which I think is a misplaced theology. But um, when you understand what has actually happened, right, uh, we have to understand the full picture. So you look at the full picture. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? Satan was condemned. Satan was judged. We were acquitted. And that means the work was done. And there are no more cases against us. Romans 8. You know, who will lay anything to the charge? Who will bring anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who is justified. That means the believer is justified. The believer no longer has to go and defend himself in the court before God. The work is done. Satan has been judged, you know, John, uh, John, uh, uh, John 16, 8, he's been judged. Uh, so that's done. So there is no, Satan at this point has no access into heaven. So Revelation 12 describes him making an attempt to get into heaven, but 
he can't even get in there because Michael and the Archangels are there saying, sorry, no entry. Right? So he's making an attempt, but he can't enter. So is Satan accusing the believer before the throne of God now? No. So then in what sense is the accusation coming? It's the accusations are coming to us in the area of our minds. Right? So he's accusing us before God. So he's coming and telling you and me, we are worthless We in the eyes of God. We are useless. God doesn't love us. God doesn't care for us. So what's he doing? He's accusing us before God. Now, the other way to look at it is also in Hebrews 4. You know, Hebrews 4, 16 says that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are tempted. That means the way Satan deals with us is the way he dealt with Jesus. Do we have any record that Satan went before the Father and accused Jesus before the Father? Absolutely no. So he doesn't have the privilege against us either, right? So how does he tempt us or attack us the same way he attacked Jesus in the area of our mind? And that's the way we should understand Hebrews 12. If you don't do it that way, if you don't do it in the light of the cross, the finished work of the cross, then we come up with this strange theology of the courts of heaven and believers having to go before God and plead their case. Remember, Satan is a finite being. So if Satan had to have a court case against, you know, one million believers, your turn to defend your case will come, you know, maybe a thousand years from now. I'm just joking, but you know how that's how silly that, that teaching is. But okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Divya, for that question. Uh, we've run out of time, so uh, we will go ahead and pray and wrap up uh, this morning's mentoring hour. I uh, would like to request uh, uh, Divya, could you please lead us uh, in a word of prayer? Sure, sure, Pastor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this uh, wonderful time that you gave us, Father Lord, to understand more, Father Lord, to may, uh, have clarifications, Father Lord. Yes, Lord, your word. Uh, uh, Father Lord, as, uh, you have given us, Lord, the Holy Spirit, Lord, to uh, inspire us, to teach us, Father, the anointing that you have given us, Father Lord. Uh, yet at times, Father, we uh, try uh, and understand in uh, wrong ways, Father. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you have given us, Lord, um, uh, these uh, precious uh, pastors, Father Lord and every every one Father Lord uh, to uh, help us understand Father to interpret the scriptures in the right way uh, thank you Lord for every provision you have made uh, we pray Father Lord that uh, as you shed light into uh, all these areas Father Lord that uh, we uh, be brought closer to you have a, a really closer personal walk with you Father Lord um, help us be like uh, Father be established rooted and established Father Lord in, in your love Father Lord uh, thank you and praise you Father for this wonderful time Time. Thank you for every uh, pastor, every uh, student, Lord, who is here. Bless them, Father Lord. As we uh, move on to the our sessions, Father Lord, help us, Father, that we may uh, depend on you, that we can learn and understand and apply it in our lives, Father. And all these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Divya. Uh, thank you, uh, faculty. Thank you, students. God bless you. Um, uh, even as you continue on with your classes, have a wonderful day. We will connect again tomorrow, the Supernatural Hour. God bless. Bye for now.